My name is Susan Master, and I know in the program that was sent out, the title of this project was Cattle in the Trees, Civil Pastoralism in Chilean in Southern Patagonia, or Chilean Patagonia, something like that. I have changed it to just be agriculture in Southern Patagonia for reasons that I'll explain a little bit later in my presentation. Let's see, is it this one? Yeah. This one? Maybe towards the computer. <laughs> So I'm going to just start out a little bit about my background and explain how I got to be interested in agriculture. I grew up in a small town in northeastern Montana called Circle. It's got a population of around 600 people, many of whom are my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the town looking down from the north end, and that is the extent of it, basically, that doesn't really cut out much of it. So it is very small, and I got to grow up on a working ranch and help my dad and my uncle move cows and cut wheat and we raise beef and small grains on our place and I'm really fortunate to get to grow up in an industry that represents less than 2% of the population of the United States and that really formed like what I'm interested in and how I view the world coming from rural Montana rural area in general my cousins and my uncle still run our ranch uh, to this day and the photos have gotten significantly better and the combines have gotten bigger so that's those are the main differences and then i did my undergraduate um, studies at montana state university in bozeman i started out in political science and after about a year i started to question that decision and went back to agriculture and ended up getting my degree in crop science, which here in Chile, I thought there was a difference. You'd have crop science and animal science and conservation, and it's all under the umbrella of agronomia. So that's what I would be categorized as here. And along with that, I also studied Spanish and studied abroad at the Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia. It was an amazing experience. It was, is that where you were? Or? Yeah. yeah. So I had a really awesome semester there. That was in the spring of 2016, and I made a lot of really good friends, met a lot of cool master students in the soils program, and I decided I wanted to be able to come back to Chile, and I had connected really well with a professor there in ecology who had done a Fulbright in the States in California. And he said, well, I've got this project that we're looking at cattle grazing and how that impacts nire trees. It's a southern beech tree that's native to Chile and Argentina. And how we can use cattle grazing to increase um, the success rate of getting these trees to establish. But there's a fine balance between how many animals you can have on the ground and how many trees and looking at this. And so I used that proposal for my Fulbright application and I submitted that a year and a half ago as Antonio mentioned but in the meantime I had graduated and finished my degree and needed to get a job so I started <coughs> working in another small town not that far from where I grew up just a little closer to Canada we are an hour from the border in a town called Chinook and I worked for the Natural Resources Conservation Service it's a federal agency within the Department of Agriculture and we focus, or the agency focuses, on working with private landowners on their private ground and offering them technical assistance. It started during the Dust Bowl in the 1930s when we had 10 years of really bad drought and really, really um, dramatic soil erosion based on lack of water and farming practices at the time. And so they set up these stations where agronomists would help farmers improve their soil, improve their practices. And today, that's still a really big focus, and we also offer financial programs, so that if someone wants to put in fences or water tanks or have a, a system for how they're gonna move their cattle or sheep from one pasture to the next, we help them with that. And so I got to work in some pretty cool country. I had not spent a lot of time in this area of Montana prior to that. I learned a lot about how agriculture works and what people are looking for, what they're concerned about. It snowed a lot <laughs> this winter. The day I left to come to Chile, it was 30 below. And then I 
which is, I don't know what that is in Celsius, it's probably 35 below, so it's getting pretty close. And then I arrived here and it was a different season completely, so that was really fun. <laughs> but that's where I've been for the past year and I found out two months into this new job that I had received a Fulbright, which I'm very thankful for that you selected me. And I knew all along that I was gonna this was temporary and I would continue to talk with my lead professor and it was so great. I was going to get to go back to Valdivia and work with cows in Patagonia and I was so excited and then life happened. <laughs> <laughs> and the project that um, my professor Maximo Alonso had proposed was dependent on Fondesit um, grant money and they applied in 2017 and did not receive that grant and then they put in another proposal in 2018 which also did not go through. And so that project at some point hopefully will go forward because I think it is really pertinent to what people are doing in Magallanes. But at the moment it's on the shelf. And so I talked with a friend of mine that I'd met while studying abroad who is from Punta Arenas. He had done some of his undergrad work there. And Professor Sergio Radic is an agronomist at that university. And he said, he would, he's really cool. He'd probably love to have you. And they're on the list of universities that accept Fulbright students, so I got in touch with him and he said, yeah, come down, this is the research I'm working on. So instead of Valdivia, I'm going a little bit farther south. <laughs> Just uh, quite a bit, <laughs> yeah. I, where I was living is at the 47th parallel on the north side, and this is 53 something, so when people, when people at home ask me, where are you going, I tell them, why are you going there? <laughs> it's colder <laughs> than where we live, but which isn't actually true. But that's just a map of where I'm going. Some of the research projects that Dr. Radic is involved with, his main one is remote sensing. So this is the use of satellite imagery. It's open source information that anyone can access online for, three, for free through the Landsat satellites. They pass over any particular area every 16 days and they take photos that I believe have a resolution of 30 meters. And then we're using this um, imagery for helping people pick spots to take soil samples. In Patagonia or in the area around Punta Arenas, it's a lot of extensive grazing of sheep, but people are also looking into ways to improve their pastures. That can mean putting down nitrogen fertilizer, that can mean planting improved species that have been bred to be higher producing or grow at different points of the year. And before you can do that, it's, it's best if you can get a soil sample. So you know if you have really low pH soil or if you have high salt content, anything that's going to pose a problem to what you want to do. But these um, ranches or farms down there are huge. There's something, I think the average size is 6,000 hectares. And so being able to go out and dig a hole in the ground and have it be representative is really tricky to do if you don't have a map. This is one study that was done in 2015. Their study area was right on the line in Tierra del Fuego between the Chilean and Argentinian side. It was about 4,000 hectares. And they took imagery from the Landsat satellites. And you can classify the type of vegetation that's growing based on the amount, the bands of light that are coming off. And they were able to identify seven different land types and then the bottom two graphs are elevations so you have different the colors are different percentages of slope and then they um, break that into two categories if it's plano flat ondulado if it's up to a slope of i think 20 percent is where they're looking at and then they're able to take all of these layers of images using QGIS, it's like ArcGIS, but the free version. <laughs> and, oops, I went too far. And then you put that together in layers, and those cells are five hectares each, and the um, different colored squares show areas that are homogenous, so that entire five acres is a matorral, and it is all this slope. So you should take your sample here, and this is how many you should take, and hopefully this will save us time and money and get you on the ground faster. And so that is one project I'm interested in. And then another area is soil classification. There's not a lot, there's not a very well systemized 
way of saying what kind of soils are present in Patagonia. There's a lot of information, but it's, it's not all together and well organized. One of my prof the professors I knew from the Austral actually worked with Dr. Radig on this one. They looked at three different landform types. The above picture would be shrub brush land, and then the middle one is a bunch grass, and then the bottom is what's called a vega. And I tried, a friend of mine asked me, how do you say that in English? And we had to Google photos and look at it and like, um, lowlands, is that, is that the right word? Sure, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> but they did soil profiles in all of these spots to see if there were any heart um, patterns between what's growing above ground and what's going on below ground, which ones have high calcium content, which ones have a high pH, and which ones might be salt affected. And then, as I said before, a lot of this area is um, dedicated to sheep grazing if it's an agricultural production. Animals have different nutritional needs throughout the year based on if they're in gestation or if they're lactating or if they're dry. And one of the limiting factors in their diet can be protein content and protein intake because as plants dry out, the amount of woody material goes up and the amount of protein goes down. And one way to combat that is to introduce leguminous species. That's anything in the pea family. They have associations with bacteria. They're able to fix their own nitrogen. They're superheroes. They're really cool. <laughs> and so people in this area are introducing clover species to their mixes and looking at how much nitrogen can this realistically fix in a year. Their frost-free period is only 67 days. Mm -hmm. So that's the amount of time that you are for sh like you shouldn't kill anything, <laughs> which is really, really short. Where I live, it's 94 maybe for as a comparison. And those are other two studies. And then also looking at guanaco and sheep interactions from the angle of what their nutritional needs are. Is there any overlap? Guanaco would mostly be a browse species, so they're looking for woody shrubs and some forbs, and sheep are going to select well, if they read the grazing book, they will select for grass. <laughs> Sometimes your sheep don't read that, though, and they do the wrong things. <laughs> but it, according to our theories, they're just looking at how they're using the same landscape and how can we have producers living with wildlife and maintain area and ground for both of them. And so that's a little bit about me and what I thought I was going to do, what I hope to do now, and that's just funny. So, well, first of all, sadly, not coming to Bell's. I know. Know. I'll come by sometime. <laughs> um, so, you mentioned that the first possible application for um, for remote sensing mm -hmm. that you could be doing out of there, out of Punta Arenas, would be <clears throat> like looking at places to take soil samples to establish foundational knowledge for grazing plans? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And would that be for, so that would be like to directly help landowners slash, mm -hmm. I guess you wouldn't call it industry because they're probably like small yeah. landowners, but. Yeah, it would be, and I'm guessing also they've got research, like experiment stations at Campanike and other areas where their whole job is to go out and do research and I don't know how what the relationship is with the Inya down there, but if somebody could go out and take soil samples for you instead and have that be a time saver. But yeah, that's what it's being used for right now. And then in Montana at the university there, they're also using this to try and predict drought in the future. So if you know you've had this much precipitation so far, what's the likelihood that you will have any grass growing this summer? So that so using this and knowing how to do mapping and use GIS has a lot of Im good implications for me going forward with an ag program, just because it can be used to be predictive and help people make better decisions. Mm -hmm. For sure. Proactive instead of reactive. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the goal of sort of putting all of the knowledge about soil types together is really good and ultimately helpful. Like last year in our cohort, we had um, a girl who was studying muscle aquaculture in the Región de los Lagos, uh -huh. and um, she was super awesome and was looking at like <coughs> climate, well, like vulnerability to climate change and how muscle aquaculture can drive sustainability because it's a lot less resource intensive than like the salmonera yeah. industry. And so 
Uh, but she was talking about how just like an ongoing thing was that like tons of people are measuring water quality, but like they're not storing that information necessarily in one and place. You, yeah. People access, they're not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. The industry is not talking to the researchers. And like even after a year of her being there and facilitating it, she was like, this is still like a nightmare. So yeah. I imagine that like you can make a really big impact just by being a person who's trying to like put all the things together. Yeah, and it's I'm a little spoiled coming from the States because we do like have an, a really nice network where you can open up a map and go anywhere in the United States and you'll know what the type of soil is on the ground. So getting here and I'm seeing, seeing we don't have that like here yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Is, do you um is do you think there are many conversations or um, what's going on here around conversations of climate change and how mm -hmm. Magallanes and rangelands farming will be affected by this? I would imagine yes. that your project is one inch away from talking about how these this matrix of decisions mm -hmm. rapidly shifts when right. climate factors are. Yeah, because I know even just the year I was in Valdivia, it's the rainiest city in the country, but it was, I don't remember what percentage of normal rainfall it was, so climate change is definitely a question and an issue. And then just broader agriculture in general, irrigation practices started in the Central Valley here in Santiago, and then as it's gotten cheaper to install those systems, it's moved south, and so the dairy industry in Valdivia is able to irrigate their farmland then I remember people were talking two years ago about trying to irrigate in this area. And so use of water resources and then how that affects salt content in your soil. Because when you're artificially putting water down, you really have to watch um, your um, s amount of salt because that comes up with irrigation water. Mm -hmm. And looking at your grazing practices, how can we make our soils more resilient to changes in climate and being able to capture every single drop of water that falls is a conversation that I've had for the last year with my job and I'm interested to see what people are thinking in Patagonia and, and how that impacts them because they're definitely degraded sites that need to be um, restored. Right, or like that period of 42 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so like you've got this time amount period. of time <laughs> to have like something green and growing. Right. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and then it's a moving target. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so what, what percentage of the area is pasture land, and is there also, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, conversion practice uh, as well? Or yeah. I saw the total amount in a paper and I meant to write it down and do the calculation and I did yeah. not get it done. <laughs> so I, I don't want to speak to that just <laughs> taking a while I guess I'd probably be I'd be off. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask one, yeah. So uh, in, in moving from the sort of policy side of things where you're helping you know are you working with any policymakers here? Don't know about policymakers, but I do. I mean, just seeing what kind of networks I'm able to make when I get there potentially. I do. I have talked with one research one researcher at Campanike, which would be fun to get in on that experiment station and see what they're doing or talk to the Inya. And then I know one friend who lives in Tierra del Fuego and they run sheep, so I'd really like to work with them and get their perspective on all of this and see how, like, what they're doing moving forward. Yeah, they, yeah, that's what, that's how you say it. <laughs> well, I, I, actually, I don't know, because you run cattle, so you raise sheep, you don't grow them, you don't grow them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to say that in Spanish, actually. It's like, like yeah, criar, tiene, tiene ganado, criar ovejas or something. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. words are hard. Yes. Uh, I was just amazed that you can have sheep that far south. I know. Um, and are those sheep, are they brought further to warmer climates during winter, or are they there year round? Mm, that's a good question. And actually, Punta Arenas itself, it has, it's a fairly mild climate, actually, because it's right on the coast. Everything I've looked at, it's like average, I'm just gonna say this in Fahrenheit, 40 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit is the average temperature, so it's not an extreme climate. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, which is right across the street, so again, it's not yeah, terribly cold.
Not saying that it can't get that way, but you feed it more. <laughs> <laughs>